you all very much. Those of you all who are regular attendees are rapidly getting tired of me. Uh, <laughs> too bad. Uh, I am delighted to be here today to, uh, to introduce to Patricia Boyette. Um, and we're delighted to have published the book at the University Press of Mississippi. Uh, I, will, I will read one. There's lots of very good blurbs on the back of this book, and I recommend you look at them. One of the uh, individuals who blurbs this uh, says, Patricia Boyette has distilled a staggering amount of research into a remarkable examination of one of the least studied regions of the civil rights battlegrounds in America. And all of those things are why this book is important. Uh, Pat did a tremendous amount of work. Her dissertation was big. And, <laughs> and she then took that tremendous amount of work and turned it into just a, a fantastic book. I can't recommend this enough. Um, our friends from Lemuria are here, and they are selling copies, as always. Uh, if you are interested in, what the, in today's discussion, I will encourage you all to go to the Mississippi Book Festival on August 20th, one month from today, where you will be part of the Civil Rights Panel, uh, with several other authors, including, I think, some other UPM authors. And, uh, and that will be another, uh, and we'll be there, Clint from UPM and I, and all the rest of the staff will be there as well. So, uh, today I'm going to get out of the way so we can learn a little bit more about uh, what went on in the Piney Woods. And, uh, and we'll hope to see you all again here next week and then also at the book festival next month. Pat? Well, I want to thank, first of all, very much um, Chris for inviting me and everybody that's involved in history and lunch and uh, Craig and uh, Clint and everybody at the press because they've just done such a wonderful work for me um, on the book. Um, and I want to thank all of you. I'm just amazed how many people showed up and uh, really moved by that. So I'm excited to start talking about um, the book. Let me put my water over here. Um, Could you pull the microphone? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Is that, is that better? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm really thrilled to be here today to start talking about my the story, the story that obsessed me for well over a decade, I think. Um, it was about 17 years ago when I was an undergraduate at Mississippi Valley State University in the Delta, and I was assigned a book about the civil rights movement. I came across this passage that just continued to haunt me, um, and it was about a man by the name of Vernon Damer, who was a civil rights leader in Forest County, and he was beloved by his community and did some incredible work. And then on January 10th, 1966, eight Klansmen from neighboring Jones County came to his home and murdered him. And there was very little else in this book about him other than it was a significant case, um, but it was sort of overshadowed in this book and by you know, the Medgar Evers case and Neshoba County and some others. And I kept, you know, I kept asking my professors and reaching out to read other books about the Damer case, and I just could find barely anything about it. And I could find barely anything about Forest County or Jones County. So I started looking at primary sources, um, and I started reading newspapers. And the newspapers and the books all sort of portrayed Forest County as this um, bastion of moderation and this murder as an aberration in this county um, that, you know, the state itself was fairly notorious for racial extremism, uh, but it, it sort of acted like this was sort of a refuge, it was sort of a, um, a bastion of safety. And that just seemed sort of odd to me. Um, and it also seemed odd to me that the, uh, many of the officials and the editor of the newspaper went out of their way to point out again and again that the killers came from Jones County and that, you know, Hattiesburg had this moderate civil rights record, or even a good civil rights record. And the reason that seemed odd to me is that in history, it's really rare that something so violent, you know, it, it, such a violent tragedy occurs without some deep historical roots. And it's also also rare that, um, you know, two counties can grow up next to each other, two societies grow up next to each other in isolation. There's usually a lot of connections. And so I became so obsessed that it actually changed the course of my life because I was planning to go to New York to graduate school, but I decided I wanted to go to the University of Southern Mississippi instead. And partially because there were some great scholars there that were very familiar with the Damer case and the civil rights movement, and partially because I wanted to live and immerse myself in the culture and the community and among the people from which this case emerged. Um, and when I got there, I started, you know, there was a plethora of sources. I was very lucky as a historian in that way, um, including a 40,000 um, pages of FBI files that are unredacted, which means nothing is crossed out, <laughs> which was extraordinary. Um, but Still, I kept coming across, the, you know, at the beginning, I kept coming across sources that were trying to portray Forest County as moderate. And so I started looking deeper and deeper into the history um, and doing all kinds of research. And then I uncovered all these other cases that happened in Jones and Forest County. And what I realized, what this place was really quite fascinating and had been very overlooked by historians. And that, in fact, it wasn't a moderate place. 
in fact, that in fact also that it wasn't isolated from Jones County, that these two counties were not just linked, but deeply connected in a dark racial history of brutal injustices. And that was sometimes really depressing and hard to read. But I also found it inspiring because alongside that was this incredible crusade for racial justice that also linked these counties. And so I found it to be one of the most important places, and I was just you know, so surprised that nobody else had looked at it. And I just want to bring up a map first of Mississippi. I know a lot of you are very familiar with Mississippi, but I just kind of um, drew a line down here in Jones and Forest County. I refer to them in the book um, jointly as the Central Piney Woods. And I refer to them that way because they are in the Piney Woods region, and they're the center geographically of that region. They're also the center economically and politically, and the, I also found that they were a major, definitely the center of the civil rights and white supremacist massive uh, resistance movement in the area, but also a significant battlefield in Mississippi, a center, a central battlefield in Mississippi, and in fact, the entire South. But there were so many cases that developed there that made great changes across the country. Um, and so, um, I would have never found that if I had just focused on the civil rights movement, if I hadn't looked further back. And so today, I want to, you know, I'm trying to get it in in 45 minutes, but um, I want to trace some of that history so we can see um, when did this develop that this is, was actually a myth about this, this county being moderate, right? And why did this myth develop? Um, and there's a lot of, there was a lot of political and racial reasons why this was carefully constructed into this myth and a local war that was perpetuated through the generation. So, um, but to get there, I'm going to go back to sort of the briefly talk about the founding of the Central Piney Woods. Um, it was really sparsely populated at first because it was densely uh, populated with pines. It was hard to clear them and to make a living there. And it was also all kinds of dangers that existed um, when people were first, you know, trickling into the area. Um, and so, because of that. It was hard to develop the plantation economy and the subsequent um, white supremacist political structure that goes with that. And so one part of the myth, in all myths, there's usually some little piece of truth, right? And the piece of truth here was, it wasn't a county of moderation, but there were moderate elements. And there were even progressive elements. And that traces back to its founding. Because some of the people that settled the area did have more pro progressive concepts of uh, racial relations. Um, and also because there was a, a lot of white men coming to the area, there was a dearth of white women, you have interracial relations developing, and sometimes forced, and sometimes consensual. Um, but that led to some fluid racial relations in both areas. Um, I'm sure many of you are probably familiar with the Knight story, because now they've made a movie about uh, Victoria Bynum's wonderful book on the free state of Jones. But um, if you aren't familiar, Newt, uh, Newt Knight was uh, the grandson of a slave owner, and um, Rachel was one of the, his grandfather's slaves. And during the Civil War, he actually deserted the Confederacy and uh, launched a rebellion against the Confederacy and declared Jones, declared Jones County the free state of Jones. And after the, Rachel actually, and many slaves, helped in that effort. And then after the Civil War, um, during Reconstruction, he engaged in a common law marriage with Rachel and had several children, and they created a mixed racial community on the border of Jones and Jasper County. Um, and that's just one of the mixed racial communities that emerged in Jones County. And in Forest County, there were several, but the one I want to talk about is related to the Damer family, uh, was in the Kelly settlement, and that, um, that community emerged from John Kelly, who was a plantation owner, and he had relations with his slave, Sarah, and they had several children, and then his sons had relations with her. And whether or not those were consensual or forced, I'm not, I was not able to find. But um, what emerged from that was a mixed racial families, and he did free them during the Civil War. And then after the Civil War, many of them were able to, through homesteading acts, get land in the area. So um, you did have some progressive elements, and you did have these mixed racial communities, and partially they were allowed to emerge and continue because it was sparsely populated. But that's not going to you know, remain the case for long. Um, redemption, the, the era they refer to as redemption, uh, kind of came to Forest and Jones counties uh, on the railroads. A man by the name of uh, Captain Hardy um, decided to put a railroad depot in Hattiesburg, which was then called the Borden Settlement. He named it uh, Hattiesburg after his wife. And that was the seat of Forest County. And that, as you can see here, that connected it to many major cities, like New Orleans and Mobile and so forth. Um, and Jones County also had a hub, so Laurel also became a major city at the time. 
Um, so basically, overnight, this place exploded because you needed people to clear the pines, you needed people to build the railroads, and then all kinds of industries are going to develop out of you know making turpentine, all kinds of things from cleared the cleared pines. And so that gave great opportunity for people, um, for many whites, to become very prosperous in this area. Um, you had you know people come, you had big railroad barons and people that were already wealthy, but they offered all kinds of jobs to people. And then once the city's built, then you need entrepreneurs, right? And you need uh, professionals, doctors, and lawyers, and all kinds of things. So there was great opportunity there. But there was also great opportunity for blacks there um, because they needed laborers, right? And they, to get people to move from wherever they are, you've got, you've got to offer them something, especially if there's you know, low demand, and high, or, I'm sorry, low supply and high demand. And so they were paying workers five times, uh, black workers five times what they could make as a sharecropper, right? So lots of people are going to leave their sharecropping farms and come down. <laughs> Um, and then for them, then with all these you know, industries and mills open, and then they need more laborers, and so you start to build a real sturdy black proletariat. But not only that, segregation, um, well, which comes with redemption, so I'm sure many of you are familiar with the era of redemption is sort of how when Reconstruction was ended and um, basically the white supremacists pushed the federal government out of the South and, and took over the South, right? And they disfranchised, they you know, implemented the Jim Crow era where they um, established segregation and uh, disfranchised African Americans. So African Americans lost political control for sure, right? Um, and um, the entire uh, political and judicial structure is white. But they did have economic opportunities, and segregation actually helped that, ironically, because whites wanted to make sure that they had separate schools and separate churches and separate businesses, and so they needed to hire black teachers and principals and bring in black ministers, and they also banned blacks from most you know, restaurants, um, and so that gave an opportunity for, for black entrepreneurs to open restaurants. Many doctors and dentists and pharmacists refuse to see black patients, so that opens opportunities for black dentists and doctors and pharmacists, and actually whites would help that because they were trying to sustain this segregated society. And so, this sparsely populated area suddenly becomes a big towns in Mississippi, and although African Americans will have a really hard time um, when they try to, you know, obtain political control, they are having real significant economic opportunities. Um, that's not to say that they didn't ever resist their oppression. I mean, African Americans have resisted their oppression since they arrived in 1619, right? Um, but it just made it hard to do direct action kind of protest, right? Um, the uh, life under Jim Crow, you know, offered all kinds of indignities, of course, um, and it offered all kinds of violence too. It was a very dangerous place, all over the South for African Americans, um, and that was also true in the Central Piney Woods. So, what became what's sort of fascinating me though about the Central Piney Woods was how complex it was, because you will have some moderate whites, you will have some progressive whites but you'll also have some really radical and conservative whites come into the area at this time and try to really enforce the racial mores, right? And so power and wealth usually go together. But many of the whites wanted to make sure the blacks that were becoming into the middle class and there were even blacks that were becoming wealthy would not have political power, right? And there's two ways they could make sure of doing that. One was through the judiciary and the other is through violence. Um, why I say through the judiciary, since they had, if you couldn't vote, that means you can't elect a mayor who appoints the you know, chief of police, who then hires white police, or you couldn't elect the sheriff, or the judges, or the DAs. Um, and so your whole, your whole judicial structure is white. And you can't even serve on juries if you don't vote, because they get open voting rolls. Um, so blacks could not expect justice, basically, if, if, if they, particularly if they harmed someone, if they were accused of harming someone that was white. Um, in terms of vi violence, uh, the fact that Hattiesburg was really portrayed as a, a city of moderation completely falls apart when you look at this, because there was a ton of lynchings in Hattiesburg. Um, actually, uh, and in Laurel, a, a civil rights activist had referred to Laurel as a town of lynchings and hangings, and a newspaper had referred to Hattiesburg as a hub of black lynchings. Um, and there were quite a number of them at the turn of the century. And a lot of them had to do with trying to make sure they could put, quote, blacks in a place. Um, when blacks tried to protest that. For example, they tried, there was a, a hor horrific lynching in Hattiesburg, and um, blacks gathered to try to launch a major protest, street protest of that. The mob reformed and came down the street and said they would kill anyone if they did not disperse. So that's how difficult it was. 
in Jones County, a black man in the 20s tried to register to vote and contacted the NAACP to get their help. Um, but pretty soon the NAACP called him and said, you have to get out of town, they're gonna lynch you. And so it was nearly impossible to establish a civil rights direct action protest movement um, before World War II. So, um, the, but the, the civil rights, a lot of civil rights scholars had many arguments over when the civil rights movement starts, right? Um, we used to make the argument, many scholars made the argument that it starts either with 54, the Brown versus Board of Education, or 55, the Montgomery bus boycott, and ends with Selma, uh, Montgomery March of 65, and the Voting Rights Act, or ends with Martin Luther King's assassination in 68. Um, but other scholars came along and made the argument that, wait a second, there was all these efforts beforehand, there's protests all over the South. They might not have the same intensity as they did in these years, but they're there. And so then uh, scholars started to use the phrase the long civil rights movement, right? Um, places like Louisiana, you would see protests you know, back in the World War I era. Um, but then other scholars came along and said, wait a second, if you say that, then you know, why is the civil rights movement important? And so when I was looking at um, the whole, you know, this whole sort of historiography and then looking particularly at the Central Piney Woods, what I have found is that what you really have is a black liberation movement, right? I mean, it's just like the black freedom movement you had um, to obtain emancipation. It has several phases. You have a black liberation movement that I think we're still in and where blacks are seeking to achieve equality, right? And it comes in different phases and it, and it occurs in different ways in different places. And a lot of the reasons it differs is it kind of depends on the oppression that blacks face. Um, in Mississippi, Mississippi is one of the toughest states um, for the civil rights movement to crack, period. Um, the Central Party Woods was also particularly tough, and so you don't, you have, you know, moments when people try to protest, but it's, it's almost suicidal, right? Um, when it really comes is World War II, when it really starts, I mean, not the civil rights movement itself, but the formation and foundation of it. Um, and some reasons for that is, one is you have, um, with World War II, you have a president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, saying we're fighting against tyranny, right? And we're fighting for more freedoms. But very easily, our American enemies can say, okay, you're fighting for freedom, but then why are you treating African Americans like this, right? Why are you lynching African Americans? Why aren't you providing them justice? Why aren't you letting them vote? Um, and try, you know, Japanese Americans particularly, the, I'm sorry, the Japanese particularly, uh, try to point that out. Of course, you know, America also interned Japanese Americans. And so, you know, these were, there was a great creed America was preaching, but it wasn't living up to it. Um, and so that was um, a real starter for uh, many places in America to start civil rights movement. A lot of the black newspapers, for example, were really important in this. The Chicago Defender and the Pittsburgh Courier, um, after a lynching during World War II in Sykeston, Missouri, they started the double V campaign, double victory. Victory abroad and victory at home against tyranny in both places. Um, and that took hold in the Central Party Woods. They, the, the, um, there was, because of all these entrepreneurs, they had black newspapers that they disseminated, sometimes for free, um, to black citizens of these counties. So um, that motivated, people were always motivated, right, to achieve change, but they hadn't been able to do much direct action protest to achieve political um, or social equality. Um, but many people like Vernon Dayworth. Um, the, uh, who is related back to the, who I was mentioning in the beginning, um, he came from the Kelly settlement, his, his uh, relatives, or his, sorry, his heritage stretches back to the John Kelly um, and Sarah uh, uh, relationship. Um, and he had, his family had been, had achieved land through homesteading. And so over the years, his family had increased that land ownership, and Vernon Damer himself was particularly brilliant businessman. And he um, opened a store, a gas station, he had grist mills and all kinds of things. And so he became quite wealthy. Um, and you know that's gonna be seen as rather threatening to some whites in the area. But during World War II, he took some risks, right? Um, and a lot of people, a lot, you know, a lot of African Americans and prosperous were a little reluctant to take risks because you know, you've got, um, you know, it's, it's a refuge, but it's a tenuous refuge. And so if you go out of that, you know, could they take your business? Sure, right? I mean, he gets his insurance for his land from white businesses. Um, he gets his loans from white banks. And so this is always very dangerous to do, but he was willing to do it. And during World War II, he not only joined some civic groups that um, lobbied the, the white powers that be for infrastructure changes, but he also tried to vote. 
uh, on several occasions, which is incredibly dangerous. And uh, Forest County has one of the worst records, actually, of <laughs> registering African Americans. Um, so, and he also, at the end of World War II, was one of the founding members of the Forest County branch of the NAACP. So there were people that were, you know, laying the foundation for the movement, but they always were reminded of how dangerous it was. Howard Wash was uh, a, a worker on, he lived on a farm, um, a dairy farm with his wife Louise and eight children in a two-room shack. Um, and he worked for a very difficult employer, Clint Melbourne, um, who had a reputation for being pretty tough. And um, Howard himself had no reputation for violence or for a, a criminal record whatsoever. But one day in the spring of 1942, there was an altercation that uh, several witnesses overheard but didn't see, and that altercation turned violent. And ultimately, Howard Wash killed his boss and then fled. A posse hunted him down and jailed him, and normally, like many other stories prior to this, where someone like that would have been, in a case like that, they would have been lynched. But the sheriff, so you have some moderate elements here, um, the sheriff of Jones County, uh, Sheriff Reddick, told the mob to go away, and he said, you know, he locked him safely, and they had a, you know, pretty fortified jail cell there, um, and said, let's let justice take its course. So they had a trial. He also had access to attorneys. Sometimes you got a terrible attorney, right, that just defended you because they had to, um, but didn't really launch a rigorous defense. Well, his attorney did. He even put him on the stand. And Howard Wash, from the stand, said that he killed his boss in self-defense, that his boss had come at him with a shovel, and so he fought back. The jury was an all-white male jury. They pretty much immediately found him guilty, but they couldn't agree on sentencing him to death, which was fairly rare, because usually they would, if they found him guilty in a case like that, they'd send him to death. So that, some people have, have argued that that, you know, conveys that some were not sure it was maybe self-defense. Um, regardless, um, that was to be the sentence. He was, so he couldn't get capital punishment, so Mississippi law stated then that he had to be sentenced to life instead. Um, the Wellborn clan refused to accept that. So about 100, the clan and uh, about 100 people showed up outside, I don't mean clan with a K, clan with a C, uh, the Wellborn clan uh, showed up outside the um, jailhouse and demanded that the sheriff deliver Howard Wash to them. He refused, and he actually held a gun in the crowd and tried pretty hard to hold them off. But ultimately, he's overrun, and um, still, they would not have been able to get in the jail cell unless the jailer gave him the, the key, which he did. He let him into the jail cell. Um, so they got Howard uh, Wash, and they took him to the Welburn property and hung him from the bridge. That might have been the end of it, and it might not have ever even you know, received any attention, but this is the middle of World War II. And the NAACP learned of this case. Somebody anonymously wrote them a letter. And they uh, started to talk to uh, President Roosevelt and demanded justice. And so President Roosevelt was very concerned. He also got intelligence from the State Department that he had to be careful that this case could be used um, as propaganda against the United States. And so he immediately told J. Edgar Hoover, you get the team down there and find out what happened. They got, collected a ton of evidence. They had um, a confession from one of the lynchers. They um, had many of the, the Howard Wash's fellow inmates, black inmates, testify that they saw the jailer open the door and let them in. The sheriff identified several members of the lynch mob. That's pretty good evidence to go to a case with, right? And so they got indictments. This was a watershed moment because the federal government had not intervened in a lynching case in Mississippi since Reconstruction and had only intervened in any lynching cases in the South for about four times. And so this was um, a really big deal. Getting a conviction <laughs> was another thing, right? Um, they presented a very strong case, except for some of the black inmates uh, refused to take the stand and one, the one that took the stand refused to identify the jailer. Um, and likely they were you know, threatened. Um, this was very dangerous for them. Um, the, uh, the, the mob member who had confessed recanted his confession. So all they had then was the uh, um, Sheriff Reddick. But still, that was still a pretty strong case. Um, they could still present the confession too. Um, the defense really did not try to invalidate any of the evidence. What they actually focused on it was in their closing arguments, they brought up the lost cause, and don't let the federal government come in here and intervene in our affairs, right? Um, the prosecutors tried to use another war, World War II, and they tried to compare the white lynch mob to uh, Hitler's Nazis, right? And made very strong arguments that way. When the case went to the jury, 
Um, one person voted for conviction, which was actually quite extraordinary at the time, but 11 have voted for acquittal. They took a recess the next day, all vote for acquittal, right? And you know, who knows if there was probably pressure put on that person. Um, that doesn't mean this case didn't matter, though, because it established a precedent of federal intervention. Um, I think I skipped one. Uh, so that did establish a, a precedent of federal intervention, and it it also kind of laid the groundwork for a civil rights movement to grow here, for an NAACP to come in, right? That there is some hope here. I mean, an all-white jury did agree to indict, but it didn't agree to convict, but it's something. Um, it also taught the white supremacists a lesson. They realized that it was going to be much harder to get away with blatant mob lynchings, right? Um, where their faces are in masks and so forth. So the next really significant case I looked at in the area was in Jones County of Willie McGee. Um, Willie McGee was an African American who was accused um, of raping a white woman in Jones County. Um, he denied the charges, um, he, but he probably would have been lynched in any other time, right? But this is on the heels, this is in 45, this is on the heels of World II, it's on the heels of the, uh, the Howard Wash case. And so um, the authorities take great pains to protect him. They take him to Jackson and put him in a fortified jail there. Um, but they intend to make sure that he is convicted, right? What um, many civil rights uh, scholars have called a legal lynching. Um, they are going to try him very quickly and they're gonna to try to get a confession from him very quickly. And later, Willie McGee will say they beat him mercifully, like mercilessly for three weeks until he signed the confession that they wrote. And then he is brought um, to uh, Jones County for his trial, but they do protect him with the National Guard. They don't want to lynch him, right? They want him convicted and sentenced to death, because you could be sentenced to death for rape in the, at this time. Um, his trial takes less than half a day, um, his defense lawyers present a very lackluster defense. They obviously did not want the case. They only met with him briefly. Um, the prosecution presents an incredibly weak case. The only thing they have is that William McGee's truck was allegedly seen in the area, not even at her house, but in the area. Um, they present uh, his underwear that had blood stains on it that they said the blood stains were from uh, Willette Hawkins, who they claimed was menstruating at the time. They didn't test the blood. The defense attorneys didn't even ask them about the blood or even to see them shorts. Um, when Willette Hawkins testified, she testified that it was too dark to see her uh, attacker's face. She claimed that she knew he was black because the feeling of his hair is what she claimed. But she had no description of him other than he was huge. Well, Willie McGee was 5'7", and she was 5'8". Um, so <laughs> that, that just, you know, but the defense attorneys don't even bother to question that description whatsoever. Also, her uh, description, she says he came through the window. She saw him come through the window. The confession says he came through the front door. She says he cut off the electricity. The sheriff who later testifies um, says that the electricity was on when he got there and nobody had fixed it. So there was just so many discrepancies that they didn't even bother, and that's just a few. Um, they didn't even, the defense didn't even bother to question any of these things. And they don't put Lily McGee on the stand. They don't even actually ever ask him his story, but even when they're alone with him. Um, he, when the case goes to the jury, and within like five minutes, they decide he's guilty, and immediately the judge sentences them to death. And that probably would have been the end of his life immediately um, had it not been for um, the Civil Rights Congress. The Civil Rights Congress uh, was a organization that had, uh, that was a communist organization that fought for civil rights and labor rights. Um, the CRC and the NAACP were at this time going into the South and picking up a lot of cases like this. It would have been better for me probably if the NAACP was the one to pick up this case because what's really difficult at this time is um, anything associated with communism in this era that becomes a very paranoid era can really harm the person, right? Um, but they will try valiantly to save his life. Um, the Cold War just had a, 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 a kind of a, it was a double-edged sword for civil rights. On the one hand, right, the federal government is uh, very aware that their enemies, just like in the World War II, their enemies here can use mistreatment of people of color to say <coughs> capitalism is not good, you know, come to the side of communism, right? On the other hand, people are really afraid of communism. There's a lot of knowledge about Stalinism and, you know, um, the, the not as much knowledge we have today, but the violence being perpetrated against people there. And so you also have McCarthyism, where you know Senator Joseph McCarthy basically made up a list 
um, of people that he claimed were communists, and people thought, you know, everybody was communist, right? Um, and so this was really difficult for McGee, but this is the this is the people who are defending him, right? Um, and they do a rather good job. They have a lot of New York lawyers, the most famous being Bella Abza, um, but they have to have Mississippi lawyers who have passed the Mississippi bar, and they couldn't find anyone in Jones County County willing to represent McGee. So they come to Jackson, which was had a more progressive pool of people and, and lawyers, and they were able to find some lawyers to defend him. Um, so the case goes through two more renditions. He's found guilty for the second time, and then it goes through a third. His, in his second and third case, he actually gets a, a good defense, um, but he doesn't get a fair trial. So what I mean by that is um, his lawyers will present things. First of all, they'll present, for example, the underwear. They'll say, we need to see the underwear. Well, there's no blood stain on it by the time they show it to him. <laughs> it's never been tested. Um, so they question that. Uh, Willette Hawkins had argued that she, in the first case when she testified, she said that the intruder told her he wanted to rape her and she didn't fight at all. Um, which, of course, if that happened, that's still rape. But at the time, well, it's considered rape today. At the time, actually, the Mississippi statute said it was not rape unless you fought your attacker. Um, so even though that's a horrible law, <laughs> um, it was something that defense attorneys could use, right? Um, and so they did use that in the second, third case. Like, well, you said you didn't fight your attacker. Well, then she says, I did fight. And so she kind of completely changes her story, right? Um, the uh, other thing that they point out is um, they, in the third trial, they bring a do the doctor that examined the letter Hawkins after the rape. Um, and he stated emphatically that she was not menstruating on, when he examined her. So that was all a lie, right? Um, and finally, they want to bring William McGee to the stand to invalidate the confession. But of course, the judge sends out the jury to see whether or not he's going to admit that testimony. William McGee then tells the court you know, a story that was very familiar to many African Americans of intense police brutality, that he was brutally beaten on the streets when he was arrested, that when he was put in the police car and driven to, Jack to Jackson, they said, if you don't confess, we're going to deliver you to a mob, and that they continued to beat him um, and threatened to deliver him to a mob until he finally wore up and signed the confession that they wrote. Um, that also helped. There was one of the police that he accused of brutality was already under investigation for brutality in another case against a white person. So, um, you know, uh, he should. The judge should have admitted it. He did not. And so again, he's found guilty, and again, he's sentenced to death. Um, the civil rights uh, Congress refuses, though, to give up. They appeal to every higher court that they can, including the Supreme Court, and they launch major protests all across America in at Times Square, in Mississippi, in Jackson particularly, um, in uh, Washington at the Lincoln Memorial. Um, they get a lot of national and international publicity even. Um, and they get lots of criticism coming back to the United States. The Chinese Communist Party points out, you know, this case is an example of how America mistreats African Americans, for example. Um, and uh, uh, William Faulkner and Paul Robinson, some really famous people, um, come out in support of William McGee. Um, but it, this is a, so, so difficult. And one of the things that's really interesting that the Civil Rights Congress tried to do is um, they tried to what, they tried to make William McGee into a mockingbird, basically, right? Because in this era, um, and, and still today, some I would argue is that. Um, when African Americans are accused of something, if they don't have some pristine background, um, they're less likely to be believed and so than white people. And so they tried to make, Willie McGee um, was not perfect. He had cheated on his wife. Um, his story starts to come out. He told the CRC that he had an affair with Gillette Hawkins, and he tried to break that affair off because he wanted to reconcile with his wife. And she threatened him that if he, did, that if he left her, that something terrible would happen to him. So that's what he then tells the CRC. And then they start to publicize this story. Once, you know, they, they, they're at their wit end. They know this is really difficult to try to pull off, right? But this is, this is their last card, right? Um, but in that process, they kind of try to wipe his, you know, his past clean. And they try to make him like this perfect mockingbird, right? Um, and uh, and they tur try to turn Willette Hawkins into a rapist, basically. And so it, it's, uh, they're, they're both sort of trying to play a morality play. Um, in the meantime, Jones County officials are using the Cold War, the fear of communism. They red-bake this case. Um, you know, their congressmen and senators will go on the floor and say, 
see this case as an example of the invasion of communism into Mississippi. That they're trying to get African Americans to, um, you know, revolt against the state. For example, I mean, there was less than one percent of communists, registered communists, that were in Mississippi, right? But they made the argument they were trying to that, that that's what they were trying to do. So ultimately, in large part, I would argue because of this red baiting, the federal government was afraid to touch this case, right? Uh, the NAACP even had removed itself from the case until the end. They, they finally at the end, they did start to join some of the protests with CRC, but they were afraid of being linked with them. Um, so Truman, they had wrote a letter to uh, President Truman asking for a pardon, he denies it. The Supreme Court refuses to hear the case. Um, the governor of Mississippi refuses to relook at the case. And so on the night of May 7, 1951, uh, Willie McGee is transported from his jail in Jackson and taken down to um, Jones County following his portable electric chair uh, the whole way. And by midnight, a crowd of about 500 or so people, some argue 1,000, um, gathered outside the Jones County Courthouse, and radio broadcasters were there to give a play-by-play, -play, basically, of this execution uh, on the radio. And uh, at 12.02, he was executed in the Jones County Jailhouse. Um, I should also mention that um, the linkage here between Jones and Forest County is the second case was actually tried in Forest County because that was supposed to be a change of venue, but that was 30 minutes away, and the mobs that formed outside the Jones County Courthouse also formed outside the Forest County Courthouse. And so basically, Willie McGee probably never had a chance, um, but this case, that doesn't mean um, that his case wasn't important. Um, after he is executed, it got massive global publicity, um, and even people like Richard Nixon, you know, that were you know, huge on the uh, national stage criticized this case and said, you know, we need to think about how we treat African Americans in this country. We're trying to win the Cold War and we're trying to um, bring people of, you know, third world nations that are mostly populated by people of color onto our side and look how America's treating people of color. Um, so this case was very significant. Um, and it also taught civil rights activists, Vir Virginia civil rights activists, a lesson a really hard and unfair lesson, that the way to win a civil rights movement was everybody you put out front has to have as pristine a record as possible, right? Um, some of you might know a lot of the history of, for example, the Montgomery bus boycott. Uh, there was somebody else they were thinking of uh, having do the bus challenge before Rosa Parks, but she had a child out of wedlock, so they decided not to go with that. So people, you know, Rosa Parks had a pristine record. So that was a really, you know, difficult lesson. Um, in the Central Party Woods, somebody with a pristine record was Clyde Kennard. Uh, he was a military, he had served in the military. Uh, he was a product of the Kelly Settlement. He, uh, his family had a poultry farm there. Um, and he was studying at the University of Chicago when he got out of the military. Um, and was in his, ending his junior year when his stepfather had fallen ill. Uh, and his father had died many years previously. And so he came home to help his mom with the poultry plant. He wanted to finish college, an incredibly bright student. Um, and the only way to do that and help his mom with the poultry farm was to go to the University of Southern Mississippi, then called Mississippi Southern College. Um, but it was all white. Um, you know, Brown versus Board had happened in 54, and there had been many cases uh, challenging segregation at the higher education level. But still, Mississippi was completely resisting any integration, right? Um, so he applied. And he met with the president, uh, McCain, at the college, um, and they tried to keep him out uh, at first by saying things like, you know, you have to get five recommendations from alumni. Well, all alumni are white. Who's going to write him a recommendation, right? Even if they supported his cause, the danger for them of doing that um, would prevent them. So um, they, uh, but he keeps trying. And through so some of the Sovereign Commission papers, I found a conspiracy to stop him, right, from getting into University of Southern Mississippi. There was talk among Citizens Council members of murdering him. Uh, one council member said, oh, we could have, you know, a train run into his car and make it look like a train wreck. Um, but they decided against that, because, partially because, I think, of the fear of bringing the federal government in because of previous cases. Um, and so what they decided to do instead is frame him for a felony. And if you had a felony, you couldn't get in college. Plus, you'd be, you know, in jail for a number of years. So um, they framed him for stealing chicken feed for his poultry farm. The only evidence they have against him is, uh, is a witness who claimed that um, he asked him to steal the chicken feed for him. And this witness, when he gets up on the stand, 
is crying the whole time that he's trying to testify because he really didn't want to. Um, later it comes out, it has been proven today that he was forced to lie by the powers of be. Um, and he kept messing up his testimony too and saying the wrong day of when the you know, chicken pea was sold. So basically, if you go through the transcripts, it's obviously that he is innocent. Uh, but the jury very quickly finds him guilty and the judge sentences him to seven years in jail. Um, while he's in jail, he contracts stomach cancer and he's denied medical treatment. Um, when he's finally given medical treatment, they remove a tumor, then they send him back into hard labor, and he's denied medical treatment again, and to the point he's spitting up blood and crawling to the fields to work. The, um, many people in Forest County got word of this, and um, they started to protest. Vernon Damon was a very good friend of Clyde Kennard. Um, the Ladner sisters who were in college in Jackson were very good friends with Kennard. And so they led a free Kennard campaign that got national recognition and forced Governor Barnett to release him. But it was too late. I mean, basically, he died <coughs> not soon after he was released. This is in 63. Um, earlier, um, uh, Vernon Damer had been uh, worked with Kennard on many things and had worked with him some on a voting case that he got involved in uh, in the late 50s, early 60s. And this is one of the most important uh, civil rights lawsuits in the whole civil rights movement. It was against Theron Lind, who was the registrar of Forest County. Theron Lind had um, registered one African American. And he only registered that person because that person was a mixed racial heritage and he thought the person was white. So he had tried to not register any African Americans. Um, as I mentioned earlier, that you had this very uh, sturdy black proletariat and black middle class. There was many, many African Americans that could pass this very difficult test that you had to take to register to vote. Um, recently, they gave some of these tests to Harvard students and nobody passed it. So that's how difficult these things are. Um, the, uh, so they had, but what they did is they studied really hard, right, to pass it. Um, and they were trying to build a case and they worked with the Department of Justice. And the Department of Justice ultimately were able to get all those records of all those exams. And they had exams from um, white people who only had like a second or third grade education and dropped out of school who would pass. And then they had um, the test of people that had PhDs and stuff um, that did, had not passed the test that were black. And then they put these people on the stand, and when they put some of the white uh, witnesses on the stand and asked them to read their applications, they couldn't even read them. So obviously white people had filled them in, right? Um, so this was one of a really significant case, and actually um, it, they uh, won an injunction against Theron Lynn, and he was ordered to register African Americans, but he appealed. The legal process can be really long, right? And Vernon Damer was getting tired of how long that was. Um, and so he brought into uh, Hattiesburg the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee um, and they and to help mobilize uh, uh, residents to go vote and try to get a movement going. And they did some amazing work, but they needed a big, huge movement, right, to, to, just to really push the civil rights movement in Mississippi. And that's gonna, they would plan this thing called Freedom Days, which will push us into phase two of the civil rights movement. Uh, Freedom Days was in January of 1964, and what it was was civil rights leaders from all across the country and local activists um, converged on the Forest County Courthouse and protested. And they also lined up those that were eligible to vote and tried to register to vote, right? Um, and it got massive attention at first. But this is where what I was talking about the local lore. When did it start, right? That Hattiesburg is a bastion of moderation, a place where blacks can register to vote. Well, it started back, you know, when they were trying to make sure there wasn't, you know, violence didn't get the attention of the federal government, the Canard, right? Send them to jail instead. But it, they also make really um, powerful plans here, nonviolent massive resistance. They basically copy the civil rights movement and use it in a massive resistance way. They're, they're going to try as hard as they can not to use violence, at least in public, um, to prevent the media from staying there. Because media likes to cover sensational events. And if you cover sensational events enough, that forces the federal government to do something about it, right? Um, but what they'll do instead is what they call police freedom of movement. It's what Governor Johnson, by the way, adopted from Hattiesburg to try to use to keep the federal government out of Mississippi after this. Um, what it is basically is you have a mass showing of police, right? Police will arrive on the scene. So that can be intimidating to a lot of people that are going to leave, right? Just their presence. But they're ordered not to massively arrest people or beat people. They are ordered instead to barricade places where the protesters can be and then just arrest people that go outside those barricades, right? Um, now, outside of the public purview, when they arrest some of those people, some of those people are going to be brutally beaten in jail 
and the jailers will watch and do nothing. But the media doesn't know about that, and they can't take the photographs of that, and they can't put that on the news, right? Um, also, the, uh, the legal system. Jimmy Dukes and Jimmy Finch, um, Dukes becomes more moderate over time. Um, Finch was responsible for the prosecution of uh, Kennard. Um, but they, they considered themselves, or at least Dukes did consider himself moderate, but they, were, they supported segregation absolutely, right? And so what they wanted was to prevent federal intervention. And so they tried, they tried people on the letter of the law, but the letter of the law is segregation in Mississippi. So they could put people in jail for all kinds of things. They also passed, they get the uh, 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 legislator from Forest County gets the state to pass a law that you couldn't protest outside courthouses and things. So this is the way they're going to fight it. They're going to use the civil rights activist methods against them, right? Um, that might have worked, except for this guy, <laughs> right? Sam Bowers, uh, he was a, a resident of Jones County. Um, he had been part of a clan in Louisiana that had moved into Mississippi, but he wanted to form his own clan. So he formed uh, the White Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, which became one of the most violent clans in America. Um, and he spent that uh, winter and spring getting ready for Freedom Summer. Freedom Summer was a major uh, uh, operation of the Civil Rights Movement in which they brought 1,000 people into Mississippi, mostly students, mostly white people, and they picked white people because of the racism in America that they knew the media would follow white people. And the federal government would respond to things that happened to white people. Um, and that became true. But they were, uh, the Klan um, was preparing for this. They were going to launch an all-out war against the Civil Rights Movement that summer, and they did. The most famous case that came out of that, the most well-known, was the Neshoba County case, in which three civil rights workers went missing. Um, why it became, many people had gone <laughs> missing, actually. Um, but why this case got attention is because two of them were white middle-class guys from New York, right? And when the media actually um, announced this on the news, they didn't even mention James Cheney, the African-American man's name. Um, but it got the attention, right? And um, President Johnson ordered J. Edgar Hoover to go investigate the case. At first, when the FBI came, um, they just called it a missing persons case. But after they found the bodies and several other bodies of African-American civil rights activists um, and bayous and so forth, they declared a war on the Klan. So things start to change. Um, the, uh, there's so much that happened, but I know I'm running out of time. So um, I want to get to the Damer case. So there were some, um, you know, some major developments that happened in 64 and 65. Um, you have the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65, which basically should have ended Jim Crow on paper, right? Um, but you know, laws are only as effective as if they're implemented. Um, and Mississippi was still resisting. You still, I mean, most of the schools in Mississippi are still segregated, right? Um, and uh, you know, some blacks are voting, but um, still they're facing resistance, you know, to get their names on the rolls and so forth. And one of the things that Vernon Damer, who's always been active in the movement, decides is one of the reasons they're hard, getting a hard time getting blacks to register is many African Americans were afraid to go downtown to pay their poll taxes, which you still had to do for state elections. And so he met with Jimmy Dukes and Jimmy Finch um, and some other officials and asked if he could have a poll tax book at his store and people could register at his store, right? And then, you know, on voting day, lots of people go down together, so that's easier. Um, and so they agreed to do it. When that's announced on the radio, it infuriated Sam Bowers. Sam Bowers had been watching Damer, harassing Damer, having his minions harass Damer for years. Now he orders his men to execute him. Um, and so they plan it, they do dry runs of it, and then on the night of January 10th, 1966, two car loads of Klansmen arrive on his property, one at his store, one at his house. His aunt, Damer's aunt lived in the store, they shot into the store, they shot at the house, threw fire bombs in. Um, the aunt was able to escape, um, in Damer's house, he had eight children. Um, five were uh, no longer living at home. They were older and off in the military uh, or working. But three were at home um, and his wife. And it, it's a ranch-style home. And so um, they woke up when you know, their house caught a fire into the shots. Uh, and Vernon Damer said to his wife, Ellie, you know, go get the children and I'll try to hold them off. Because civil rights activists believed in self-defense, right? So they shoot back at the clan. As he's shooting back at the clan, like, she can't get to her sons because the fire blocks her, but she can get to Betty, uh, her daughter. And they try to get out a back window, but the back window is stuck. And so she's, as he's trying to hold out the Klansman, she's you know, banging against that window, desperately trying to get out. In the meantime, um, Betty gets badly burned, and um, Vernon and Damer gets badly burned. But event, uh, finally, she just, you know, for sheer will, probably gets that window open, and, and they get out of the house. Um, 
They were they all survived the immediate attack. The day was taken to the hospital, but his lungs are so badly seared and he's so badly burned. Um, he's able to talk to his family and his civil rights activists. He knew he was dying. Um, his wife didn't. She didn't want to believe he was. But um, he said to um, one of the civil rights activists, you know, I know I'm dying, but this is worth dying for, and keep up the fight. Um, and then, oh, sorry, that was <laughs> correct. Um, he didn't make it. Uh, and then his family, he has four sons serving in the military, uh, fighting for the rights he doesn't even have at home. And so they all come home, and this was some really powerful pictures that went uh, across the country. Um, the FBI is infuriated, the Department of Justice, federal government is infuriated. They, a lot of them took this really personally because they had worked with Damer on the voting rights case. Um, the community is infuriated and there's massive protests and a major revitalization of the uh, Hattiesburg movement. Um, and, you know, these pictures also, you know, uh, peak the conscience of the nation. Um, Roy Moore uh, was so furious, excuse my language, but when he got the notice that of Damer's killing, he said, send an army of agents in there, we're going to get the bastards who did this. And he's determined to get them. Um, also, what helps here is this element of moderation in Forest County, because there is an element of it. There's this awful radicalism, right, but there's this element. And until people have gotten more moderate over time. So there's massive cooperation among local and federal authorities here that you didn't have in Neshoba County. In Neshoba County, you had policemen that were Klansmen, right? Um, here you didn't. And so uh, Agent William Dukes is the brother of um, Agent, or I'm sorry, Prosecutor Jimmy Dukes. And so that helps, you know, create uh, cooperation here. Um, over the next couple of years, they arrest at one point like 17 people um, and federal and state charges, um, including Sam Bowers. Four men are uh, found guilty, three of uh, murder and one of arson. Um, so the first three of murder and Lawrence murder of arson. Cecil Sasson was the first one convicted, and he's convicted by an all-white male jury. So this is significant, right? Um, and it during this time, I have those 40,000 FBI files, <laughs> right? Um, they show clan, clan informants just you know, more and more people coming to the FBI to inform, and more and more clans have been defecting. They're afraid now. They can't get away with this anymore, right? You can't kill a black person with impunity is what this is sending a message to them. Um, unfortunately, it's not a full watershed. None of these men spend longer than 10 years in prison. Um, Byrd only spends a couple years. His sentence was commuted. Uh, Wilson, who was an elite and had all kinds of connections, spent more time out of jail on emergency leave, um, and then got on a special program to get out early and uh, Sesson and uh, Smith got out less than 10 years. Um, so it's not a full watershed in terms of the justice system, but it, it killed the Klan. It did at least do that. Um, I'm completely running out of time. So all I'm going to say, just for the phase three of the civil rights movement, I just want to mention that, um, that you know, it is ongoing and that when the civil rights, I, I see the civil rights movement itself not ending in the Central Party Woods until the early 70s, and then you get the post-civil rights phase. But you had a phase where um, people were fighting. Um, the schools, yes, they're desegregated, but people were still um, fighting to get you know, black teachers in the schools or better treatment of black students. Um, police brutality became a, a particular problem in both Hattiesburg and uh, Laurel, and uh, activists fought very hard against that to the point that they, they put cameras on police. They have cameras on police in Hattiesburg and Laurel, and they don't in many other cities across our nation. Um, and then the other thing I just want to uh, mention is um, the Damer case. They did bring the Damer case back because Sam Bowers was tried three times on state charges and one time on federal charges. He, he, all of his were mistrials, mostly because there was jury tampering. Um, in 1998, they brought his case back, um, and he was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison where he died um, by a mixed racial jury. Um, so. Uh, I think the, the movement in the Central Party Woods was incredibly powerful and important. I think it can teach us a lot today as we are in the middle of the Black Lives Matter movement today and figure out um, you know, how we can move forward and finally have racial equality in our country anyway. Thank you.